conditions that only have three or four repeat tau at the present, we don't know. All right, thank you very much, Michelle. Very Thanks. exciting. And uh, we're going to move to the next speaker. Um, it's uh, for me a great pleasure to introduce you, uh, Ken Kosick, which is the co director of the um, uh, Neuroscience Research Institute in the, the University of California, Santa Barbara. As, um, and as uh, last evening, he's also a distinguished guest, guest of the uh, city of Salamanca, but more importantly, he has, he has um, um, uh, a pastry name after him. So uh, anyway, so thank you very much, Ken, for being here. Welcome to Salamanca. Please go ahead. Thank you, Miguel. I think you've changed, you changed the title of your talk yeah. slightly, so thanks. Well, thank you very much, Miguel, and thank you, everybody, for creating uh, so many amazing memories here in Salamanca. Really, uh, it's uh, been an extraordinary time. Uh, the, the, um, there's a difference between the title and the program book and um, what I decided to talk about here, uh, called, uh, named uh, How Tau Becomes uh, Toxic. So let me jump right into the talk here. And we're going to um, first take an approach using brain organoids. And you're probably familiar with this technology. This is uh, taking human stem cells, uh, converting them to neurons, but doing it in a way in which you, some, in some cases, put them into uh, matrigel so that as they differentiate, they actually are growing in three dimensions. And that allows uh, these neurons to not only diversify, but also to actually begin to assume uh, a, remarkable, a remarkable resemblance to brain anatomy. Now, they're not brains, of course. They're tiny. Um, in the slide, in the uh, image down, at the bottom here, you can see brain organoids the way they are in our lab, just floating in the media in the dish. Uh, those little guys, when you cut them open, are really just, uh, they're quite remarkable. They have a wide diversity of cells. You can see glial cells here in green. Uh, as you move into these panels, now green uh, has changed its meaning and it becomes neurons. You can see these long axonal projections here. Uh, over here are inhibitory uh, neurons, parvalbumin neurons. And over here in green, lining this map to white dendrite, those green puncta uh, are synapses. So there's a really an extraordinary variety of uh, diversity and morphological um, resemblance to the brain in organoids. Um, and, and I won't talk about this today, but um, we recently have a paper accepted in which we can also show that when you slice the organoid and put it on an, a multi-electrode array, you can get uh, a wide range of um, electrical signals with local field potentials and uh, spiking. So to proceed now with what I want to talk about, which is because you can make organoids from any of us by just taking a small skin biopsy and reprogramming the cells, uh, we've uh, reprogrammed them to stem cells and then differentiating them to neurons, making organoids. We've done that with several cases of individuals who carried tau mutations. And uh, those particular mutations are shown right here, 337M uh, and uh, 406W. They're made here uh, in, in the dish. To those, um, those are the mutations. One of the things I would just point out in doing any kind of analysis with stem cells, a critical control are these isogenic controls. That is to take the mutation and revert it back to the wild type. So here is the wild type here. Here are the mutations down here. Uh, one of them is homozygous here in the, uh, at the 406W position. And then we uh, make organoids from these. This is work done by Stella Glaser in the lab. And um, we, uh, well, one, I'm sorry, one more thing here. This is where the two mutations are in the tau sequence. And uh, we want to show that in the particular organoids, we do indeed get a diversity of cells. And now to zero in on which populations of cells may be affected by the tau mutations. So many of you have seen this kind of uh, analysis in which you take this individual cells, you send them through a microfluidic device, and now the in you can get the transcriptomes on the individual cells. And by clustering those transcriptomes, you can actually uh, create these unsupervised clusters, uh, as you see here, just based on the transcriptomes. Let's look at this one. And um, so they are, um, 
they're clustering by an algorithm that has no knowledge of what they are. But then when you actually want to find out the identity of the cells in each cluster, you say, well, some cells have markers for astrocytes, and we color them green. Uh, some of them have uh, markers for inhibitory neurons or excitatory neurons. And that way we can colorize the clusters based on the uh, identity of the, um, what the, the identities that we've assigned through the markers that have been expressed in each one of those uh, clusters. So now what we're going to do is to look for changes in expression under, in the presence of these mutations. And of course, you have to understand the caveat here, which I'll come back to this point a little bit later, that remember, organoids don't actually become fully mature. Organoids don't actually, they, they re always remain relatively immature. They certainly never develop tangles. So we're talking about here the presence of a mutation in a neuron before the disease is actually being expressed as we know the disease. And, um, but there's no way a cell likes having a mutation in it. So there's, I'm going to show you some changes, some early changes that start to flare up. And um, so that uh, is, that's beginning to venture into the problem here. We looked at several of those different clusters. Many of them had, didn't have very many differences between the control and the mutants. But we became most interested in the astrocytes. So this is that green cluster now that has been reanalyzed. We take them out and we re reanalyze re, re them into a new set of clusters. And uh, so here, whoops, uh, and uh, here are, I'm going the wrong, there we are, good, we're back. Um, here the clusters are, go, uh, the unsupervised clusters, and here they're colorized depending on whether the individual cell, remember every dot is a cell, the individual cells are either a mutant or a control. And you can see they're sort of nicely mixed together. There's really no difference in the populations of the, of the two. But when we actually now look at the transcriptional profiles in those cells that carry the mutation and those cells that do not, a particular pathway shows up to be upregulated. And that pathway is shown right here on the top cholesterol biosynthetic pathway is upregulated in those astrocytes that are carrying the mutations. And we can go further than that. We can actually uh, first validate the finding by looking at one of the expressed genes in those astrocytes. This is uh, HMG, which is a critical uh, enzyme in the uh, cholesterol pathway. When you take uh, statins to lower your cholesterol, it's targeting HMG. And uh, we can see differences in the uh, labeling. That is, the staining is increased here in the mutant relative to the control. But we can go further than that. And uh, here now we're looking at the all, this is the uh, cholesterol pathway. If you uh, follow this pathway from the very beginning, acetyl-CoA up here and going down and around, and finally ending up with cholesterol, it goes through all of those steps for which Brown and Goldstein got a Nobel Prize. You heard about that uh, from Tom when we started this uh, whole symposium. And um, so there's um, uh, HMG at the top, and every one of those enzymes in the pathway that is colored pink is upregulated in the astrocytes carrying the tau mutation. So. We're not looking at an isolated thing here. We're looking at changes that are going on through an entire pathway uh, that is kind of a validation that we're looking on at the, a pathway that appears to be of interest. Now, and then we take this another step because every one of these enzymes, these, um, every one of these uh, transcripts that encodes an enzyme is actually producing a product. It's producing uh, a lipid leading to cholesterol. So we can now perform lipidomics on the, uh, on, on the organoids. And here uh, you can see now what's being uh, studied here is to use LCMS, a mass spectroscopy, to actually measure the individual 
lipid products in that pathway. And you can see here that the, the ones in red are um, upregulated, the ones in green did not change, and the ones in black were not detectable. Uh, so here, once again, you can see that several intermediates have all been upregulated uh, of this pathway. And if you look now, if you combine the two data sets, uh, there's a lot of ways of looking at it. One way here is, you can see here is the, um, this is the, the gene that encodes for an enzyme in the pathway making cholesterol, and its product, 7-dihydrocholesterol, is actually also upregulated. So we have an increase in the transcript, which is probably showing an increase in the protein, which is leading to an increase in the product. And um, so that, I think that becomes very satisfying that we're on the right track here. Um, now I want to change the topic a little bit and continue to build on this cholesterol story. So pushing this uh, further with, a, with different technologies, I'm really, we're getting away from organoids and going to talk about uh, lipid droplets. So uh, many cells are just, are filled with uh, these droplets that are made up of lipids and uh, they often increase in disease states. Many people in the audience here work on lipid droplets. And um, we can actually do several procedures that will isolate the uh, lipid droplets. And uh, we can then study them with regard to tau oligomerization uh, in this context, in an in vitro context when they are uh, becoming uh, associated with the lipid droplets experimentally. And um, so, here's, uh, what's, here are some of the images that we can uh, create with, um, by combining the tau with lipid droplets. And what we're seeing here is, is that when you take these isolated lipid droplets in green and purify tau, that is, they, the structures begin to overlap. Uh, here they are, once again, overlapping structures in 45 minutes and seven days. If instead of using tau monomers, we use tau oligomers, we also get an association here. And, um, and even with uh, fibrils, you can see some degree of an association. So here it is uh, blown up. This is the oligomer in which the uh, lipid droplet in green is being surrounded by the, um, the tau filaments. And in some cases, more so with monomer, actually enters the lipid droplet. So now we're, we're creating a very hydrophobic environment. And I'm going to discuss that in a little more detail. Uh, so, but before I get to that, now we can actually um, take this at the electron microscopic level and show here that uh, the, by adding those lipid droplets, taking the images that I just showed you, and now looking at them at the EM level, you can begin to see that, uh, all, that around these lipid droplets, let's go over to this one, around the lipid droplets on the section, we have induced uh, a lot of uh, filaments. So we're starting here with tau oligomers. Just the oligomers um, alone just stay as oligomers. They don't do much. But if you add the lipid droplets up here and over here, you induce the fibrillization. Uh, now, based on the um, extraordinary work that uh, you just heard from Michel, which has really, I think, inspired the entire tau field, um, we have built on that a little bit to, uh, to look at, at some of the uh, folds that Michel discovered. And uh, here is the, uh, one of them. He talked about this, CBD, corticobasal uh, degeneration. And uh, the fold that he showed here is right in here. In, uh, this whole thing is the fold. But we have zeroed in on this piece in red that we call either HP1 or HP2, depending on whether we have put one of the well-known tau mutations into that region or not. That, that small fragment of about 20 amino acids, there they are, that small piece is that forms a hairpin, according to the cryo work, and um, that hairpin is excluded water. It has this, uh, it, it's, it's held together as a hairpin because the charges are matching up, so it's, it has a relatively hydrophobic environment, and quite remarkably, that small piece by itself can, with or without the mutation, can form uh, filaments. 
These filaments, they, they look like they have some kind of paired helical filament, uh, some sort of periodicity that may be deceiving. Um, I would have to talk to Michelle about this because I, that may just be a ribbon twisting rather than actually a paired helical filament. So I'm not sure about that yet. But you can see the fact that this small piece can form filaments, I think, is fairly interesting. Um, and uh, here, here we're now going uh, back to the lipid droplet assay and can show that now lipid droplets don't only aggregate the tau, but they can also aggregate, in this case, HP2, the one that carried the mutation. They can also do it with HP1. Uh, and uh, the way we show that um, there is formation, that the lipid droplets are forming the filaments is by using a technique called uh, thioflavin. And here you can show that uh, thioflavin is indicating a sort of a stacked beta structure. And you can show here that the thioflavin has gone up as it should with heparin, but even with the lipid droplets, we get a rather marked increase in the thioflavin signal. One of this, this is just a little tangential comment here. One of the things we've stumbled into is, is that there is a, um, uh, an approved drug that we uh, would not, not want to use in any one of our settings, but it's a drug called uh, chromalin that is used to treat asthma. All of that is rather irrelevant to what, uh, the reason we chose it. We chose to look at chromalin because of this remarkable chemical structure, which is uh, creating, again, a very hydrophobic environment. And you can see here that also chromalin can also induce filaments, and it can induce filaments using HP2 or just with uh, tau alone. The filaments that are formed with HP2 are really weird. They, they have these, they're these hairy structures of the filaments, and they have these side, smaller side filaments poking out. Um, I have no idea what that means, that they, they um, it does that. And um, so now I want to use another technology. This is a technology in which you do, it's um, called DEER double electron electron resonance. Uh, using, you, you label uh, cysteines at say two places and uh, you can look at the coordination of their spin to actually calculate the distance between those two labeled cysteines. So, um, so that, that's, there's the background and here's the data in which you can now, um, just as I showed you before, use HP2 to template uh, the misfolding uh, to induce the filament formation and probably template, with, that's the hypothesis, the misfolding of tau. So to address the hypothesis part, whether it did indeed template anything, we use this DEER technology. And here is, here's the piece we put in. There's that fragment from the CBD fold. And now labeling these residues far outside the hairpin, we can show that there's a distance change here induced by the addition of the HP2 filament. So we've induced, using the small piece, we've actually been able to make a change in the larger structure. Now, um, and so now here's the final part, because as you, as you well know, uh, we, many of us believe that an aspect of the tauopathies, of the problem created by tauopathies, is the fact that tau spreads from one cell to another. You have tau that becomes abnormal in one cell, it gets out, and it templates the misfolding of normal tau in the neighboring cell. And that's called seeding. So to study, so we now ask the question, well, what, can HP2 actually even, can it seed normal tau when we add it to cells? And so here is, um, tau being labeled in the cell. This is a pattern that you're familiar with. It's just, uh, it's, it's tau is, uh, we, we've put, expressed tau 187. This is not full length tau, but this also works for full length tau. And we can, we can label the microtubules in a typical microtubule pattern. But when you add HP2 uh, to the media, you lose this beautiful microtubule pattern. It collapses and now you get these uh, seeds 24 hours after fibril addition. So we believe that we can actually um, now use this small fragment 
to induce the seeding of tau, I would feel rather certain that there are many other small fragments of tau that would be very judiciously discovered or created or synthesized by um, just taking the criteria for being relatively hydrophobic and they would have the possibility for probably also seeding uh, changes in tau conformation. So now the last uh, bit of technology I want to show is just the science always jumps ahead by leaps and bounds with technology. I mean, all the cryo work taught us so much. And uh, so here's another interesting technology uh, from a, a, a postdoc that recently joined the lab, Yaron Bai, uh, who brought to the lab a technology um, of um, a, a sort of a specialized uh, IR spectroscopy, optical photothermal infrared spectroscopy. And uh, it will allow us to see inside cells the um, at, a, at a, a pinpoint individual regions within the cells based on the vibration of different types of bonds. So there's vibrations that are very different in lipids versus, say, carbohydrates versus proteins. So we can actually see that. We can look for these double bonds between the carbon and the oxygen because they will have a distinct peak, and then we can look at their wave numbers. And um, this is just, this is actually, that, that's a cancer cell that just shows the power of the technique. Um, but now, if we apply the IR spectroscopy to a cell that has been seeded with HP2 and to look at the region of the seed, we can now show that by um, looking here in this, in this region and having, um, uh, let's, 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 uh, these would be the, the inclusions, the seeds that were induced. This is another area of the cell that does not have any seeding going on. And if we apply the spectroscopy to this region versus this region, when we're in the area that's on here, we see an additional wave number here that corresponds to lipid. So, and we don't see it over here. So, the, so this suggests to us that there has also been some sort of lipid accumulation around the point in the cell that, in which seeding is going on. Again, all pointing to a hydrophobic environment creating the conditions for tau assembly. And um, here is um, the, uh, this is more or less the same uh, data showing you uh, <coughs> lipid droplets here by the same technique. I'm going to jump over that one and just come to the final slide here, which is a very simple, uh, oversimplified model for what I've been saying, which is that tau when tau is mutant, and maybe under, under, maybe under other conditions as well, the, the presence of amyloid or CTE with brain trauma, whatever it is, tau is getting to be toxic. And one of the aspects of tau toxicity is probably to uh, destroy membranes, to burrow into membranes, to somehow disrupt membranes. And um, remember, everything I'm saying now is a hypothesis part. This is the speculation part. So I would say that mutant tau probably can damage the membranes, and that might be the reason why we saw those results in the organoids. And what that damage does, it can, it can try to trigger membrane repair. So the cholesterol biosynthesis goes up. And now you have a tendency not just to repair membranes, but making more lipid droplets and creating an environment where you can induce tau fibrillization and seeding. So let me end right there with some credits. Um, a, a large part of this work, especially some of the uh, sophisticated physical chemistry part of the work using um, the DEER technology with the spin label, uh, is through a very close collaboration with Song Hee Han uh, in the chemistry department at our institution and her graduate student, Michael Viggers. In my lab, Stella Glazer did all the work on the organoids. Many of the organoids were prepared by Sally Temple. Uh, and uh, the lipidomics was done by Oswald Quenninger, Quenberger in uh, the University of California, San Diego. Uh, there, uh, Andrew Longhini did the work on the seeding. And Yaron Bai did the work on the IR spectroscopy. And Sharon did the work on the lipid droplets. And this is our entire lab. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Ken. Very exciting stuff. Um, so the paper is now open for discussion. If there are any questions, we have one here and then another. Thank you, Kenneth. It's uh, amazing work. Um, I feel you are connecting also some dots with other uh, risk factors in dementia, for example. Do you feel that this kind of mechanism can be related also with apoi biology, for example? And other genes we have detected in GWAS associated with the biosynthesis of cholesterol. Can you connect or speculate about that? Connecting the AD risk factors and the APOE. Oh, well, that's a tall order. Uh, thank you for that. I don't, I, uh, of course, it's very difficult to make all those connections. Anything I would say is just hypothetical. We, we, I, um, I did not go into our work here on LRP1, which is a receptor for taking up tau, but that uh, APOE also binds in that region, so I think that that's one place where we're going to start to see a kind of a nexus for APOE and other factors coming together to be involved in the pathological cascade. Yes, yeah. um, amazing. Uh, no, no words, uh, really. So I have a question. So taking the suggestion by, by Tom Sutov in the keynote lecture in which he was saying that statins uh, may have side effects on the brain and, and when treating uh, hypertension. So in taking your last slide, so uh, I think it fits together. So it would be because it prevents uh, my, uh, memory repair, right? Would that... So, I, I was very pleased that Tom Sudhoff uh, also implicated a cholesterol pathway. Although I believe that the directionality of the effects we're talking about and the effects he talked about are sort of in opposite directions. Um, you know, we, we see this uh, upregulation and, um, and that goes along with an upregulation of cholesterol. He talked about an upregulation as well but then when he discussed, when he looked at a marker for cholesterol called philippin, he saw a down regulation. So he, he tried to explain this in a way, you know, in a way that I would, I would disagree. I, I liked everything about his talk except the fact that I'm not sure I agree with that last part. And uh, which was problematic for me. I, you know, I don't want to say this because he's not here to respond, but, um, you know, he emphasized neurons. Neurons don't really make very much cholesterol at all. That's why we... Uh, looked at astrocytes. If you look at all of this pathology, all of this this pathway in neurons, you don't really see that much. Yes. Yes. Very nice, Ken. I was wondering whether you could elaborate more on the potential mechanisms for the effect of abnormal tau on membrane integrity. The, the effect of the amyloid-like tau on the membrane. Yeah, uh, I wish I could answer that better. I, I just, um, I think that, again, now it's a speculation, but I do think that there is some kind of um, conjunction between this, the misfolding of tau, the creation of hydrophobicity to, the, to portions, of, portions of the molecule which makes it now easier to enter a lipid environment. That would, that would just be one hypothesis. All right, thank you very much, Ken.